All right, so let's continue. We've got this site that we brought back to life. Um, just so that we're all on the same page and such, let's uh, make a couple of setting changes here. Um, let's, uh, let's hover the mouse over Appearance. We will select Themes. So that we can focus on the e-commerce aspect of the site, I'm going to say we're going to choose a basic theme so that we focus on the, on the e-commerce more than the design. So hover over Appearance Themes, and then we've got various themes that we could use. We're going to use the basic 2015 theme. Hover over 2015 and click Activate. And now to confirm, hover over the name of your site on the top left and click Visit Site. Okay, we have the basic kind of theme, that's okay. The blog, Amazon Sales, and Facebook. So we've just got a basic theme. Uh, just because I want to focus on the concepts of the, of the plugin, of e-commerce and such, but let's go back to Dashboard, hover over the name of your site again and select Dashboard. And uh, we're going to look at sheet number five in just a moment. I want to touch on one of the last things that I touched on last time. Remember we spent some time talking about WordPress updates. Last we met, we talked about the three types of WordPress updates. The the core software, which is all the WordPress itself, the core software could be updated. The theme could need updates, the design, and plugins could need updates. As we use our current site, I see, and you should probably see, it's telling you there are updates. You might see it under the dashboard, updates, or, or you might see that spinning arrow, four. There are four updates. I can't tell at this point which of the three they are until we click. So let's take a quick moment to look at what updates are available. Click on the number four. You might have more, you might have less, but you, you have the uh, update and it's telling us an updated version of WordPress is available. Plugins, all my plugins are up to date. Themes, these three themes have updates. So to briefly reiterate from last time, remember we talked about updates, and updates are important to do because they help protect your site. If someone figures out that there's broken code in the WordPress software, or the theme, or a plugin, that's, a, that's an attack vector. That's a way for a hacker, uh, or, or a cracker, or some other uh, bad guy to get into your site. And so, you know, they might crack your, your password based on a plugin that's outdated, believe it or not. So maybe that great plugin that you use to make some nice slideshows might have a security vulnerability. And so the, the plugin authors would be providing updates for the plugin. That's one reason why you want to do updates, to stay secure. The question then comes, well, it's telling me I've got WordPress updates the core software. It's telling me I've got plugin updates and it's telling me I've got theme updates. Which one do I do? In short, all of them. But we had that long discussion last time. Go back and watch the previous video to, to remember every detail. But in short, you do want to update all the software from the most important then down to the least important in that order. Because if you make a mistake, you want to revert your site back with Duplicator before you go further. If I make an, if I do this WordPress update right now and check it and everything breaks, I might have to revert or resurrect my site back and wait for you know update version 2. Uh, if I didn't check my site from most important to least important and I made an update and another update and another and I go on and on and I wasted all my time doing those updates and then I see that my site is broken, you can't get the time back. 
So it's better to do the big updates, check the result. If, if it's a good result, then proceed. If it's a bad result and that something's broken, stop and fix it before proceeding. And unfortunately, that is a technical process sometimes. But if you've got a copy of your site in, in Duplicator, you have that safety net. Anything bad happens with your site, you can bring it back with Duplicator, as we've been doing. Mine is saying there is a brand new WordPress 4.3.1, and usually the very last digit of something dot something dot something usually means security updates, mini updates. Then larger, more important updates is the central digit, and then the last digit is a big update. Those big updates going from WordPress version 2 to 3 changed a lot. From 3 to 4 changed. Eventually we're going to get WordPress 5. That's going to be a big change. So that's why I'm saying you're going to make these updates, the big ones, and then go in and make the little ones. So just for the moment, let's select to update now. Let's update our WordPress, our main WordPress software. Notice it is telling us at the top before updating, back up your database files, that's Duplicator. Click Update there. It's going to connect to the wordpress.org site, download the files, update them, verify them, etc. If someone were to visit the site at this moment, the site would say, under maintenance, please come back. There's a maintenance mode, and I already passed. I wish it didn't pass, but there was a mention in there that said disabling maintenance mode. So when you do these updates, most of them, especially the WordPress software, your site will go into maintenance mode. Someone tries to access it to buy your product, it'll say, come back, we're in maintenance mode. So maybe you want to think about doing updates during uh, off-peak hours, off-work hours. If you often get a lot of traffic from 9 to 5, maybe do your updates at 8 p.m., 10 p.m., because that way there'll be less traffic for someone to visit your site where it says maintenance mode. WordPress 4.3, it shows us a video, what's so great about the latest version. Watch that on your own. There's a bunch of explanation. Great, we've got the new WordPress. It's better than ever. Until next version. So let's click on the, uh, go back to the updates again, click on the spinning arrow at the top. Now there's only three updates. So it says WordPress, latest version, great. Plugins, up to date, great. Themes. The 2015 theme can be updated from 1.2 to 1.3. All of these can be bumped up one version. Again, these might be useful to update to protect you from security issues. The thing that I will say, however, is you can have as many themes as you want installed, as many plugins as you want installed, but usually with, uh, well, especially with themes, you only can have one theme active at once. My whole site has a certain design, a certain theme at once. It cannot have more than one. So what I'm getting at is I would recommend if you have themes, that you're not using and probably will not use, delete them. Don't have them hanging around begging for updates. I'm not ever going to use 2013 or 2014. I'm going to use 2015 and other ones. So instead of updating these and wasting time and bandwidth, let's go delete the themes that we don't need and then only update the ones that we do care about. Let's go to the Appearance menu, Themes, I had said a little while ago to activate the 2015 theme, so that means I don't need the 2013 and the 2014. I might use one of these two. Bakery might be nice for my bakery, so I'll leave it. I'm not using it at the moment, but I'll leave it. This Top Cat Light, mm, I tried it out. It's not really going to work out for my design. I'm going to delete that one. So I'm going to only keep 2015 and Bakery. Um, to delete a theme, just hover over the theme. You need to click Theme Details in the center of the thumbnail. Theme Details. It's kind of hidden. And then Delete. A really nondescript button on the bottom right. You don't want you to accidentally delete 
all your your design and your settings and such. So I'm going to delete 2013. It'll confirm. Yes. I'm not going to use the 2014 theme either, so hover over themes, click theme details, and delete. And this top cat light doesn't quite work for me, my site, so click theme details, delete. I will keep the bakery theme, which I can easily activate later, and I'm going to keep the 2015, which is currently active. And my note for this is only keep the themes that you're going to use. Usually for myself or clients, we have two themes. The, the main theme that is the design of their site and just the basic backup 2015 theme. This one's officially from WordPress. It's the default theme that ships with WordPress. I like to keep that one hanging around just in case because it's happened to me, not on a real client, but on my own website, that I've had a website, I had a theme, uh, for whatever reason the theme author forgot about their theme and never updated it, guess what? My site got hacked because that theme had a vulnerability that was never fixed. So I was getting Google alerts telling me your site has malware. All I had to do was switch the bad theme to the basic secure theme of WordPress and then delete the bad theme, and my site was fixed. The problem was in the theme. I just deleted the theme, and I was saved. There's other kinds of hacks, of course, that maybe the plugin has a problem. Maybe someone guessed your password, someone cracked your site. Who knows? But that's why I keep the main theme and a backup theme, just to switch out of the themes in case, just in case. Let's go back to the um, theme updates icon. Notice now it's decreased all the way down to one because the only update necessary now is for the only theme that I have installed and that I care about. So let's go ahead and update our 2015 theme from 1.2 to 1.3. Now we have zero at the top. No more updates. This is a process that perhaps you do once a month. Check your, check your updates. Have it in your mind that you will do updates, but go back to the lecture of last month for all the nuances because you have all of those things to think about. Should I update this plugin or not? Should I update that theme or not? For various reasons. Any questions so far? Okay, let's talk about sheet number five. I'm going to open sheet number five. If you've got it printed out, take a look at it, but I'm going to open sheet number five here, and I'm going to take a, an, an overview of what I've got here, then we'll do it. Sheet number five is our intro to the e-commerce plugin. I have a note at the top. People always forget this or, or don't realize this. If you want to get back to your site, sometimes people close the web browser. How do I get back to my site? Here's how you get back to your site. If you're on Windows, you can type in that address, localhost slash the name of your site, which in our case is 2015-1130 slash wp-admin. That's the login screen to get back into the dashboard. Or if that doesn't work, sometimes you have to type this number, 127.0.0.1 also known as localhost, and then the rest. If you're on the Mac and you're using MAMP server, slightly different here, localhost colon 8888, and then the rest is the same. Oops, misspelling here, sorry. Admin, not admin. Admin, on the Mac. Me. That's just a note here to get you back to the back end in case you close the browser or you come back tomorrow or whatever, how to log back in. What we're going to talk about is installing a plugin, and we've been using a plugin duplicator. Plugins are mini apps that give your site extra features. 
there's no built-in backup method in WordPress. That's why we've got Duplicator. Maybe we want a really cool slideshow that has animation and sound and so forth. That's not built into WordPress. Uh, maybe the version that comes into your WordPress is not up to your specifications. There's plugins, lots of plugins, for slideshows. Maybe we want to sell products through our WordPress website. WordPress does not have a built-in feature to sell products, so that's a plugin. And in this class, we're going to be talking about a specific plugin right here, WP e-commerce, but there's more than one. There's, there's a dozen plugins for WordPress that will let you sell products. I'm going to talk about this one because the free version out of the box lets us do a lot. I'll mention another big competitor that's really nice, but the issue with that one is that oftentimes to teach in a class, it's a few too many steps just to get a basic store with the other plugin that I'll mention in a moment. But that other plugin is very powerful. It's very useful, and I've used a bunch of them. This is the one I recommend as a beginner. And if you run into its limitations, we'll, we'll address that. But I want to add this, this plugin to my site, my instructions. You're going to click, you're going to hover, or you're going to click on plugins and go to add new. In the search box, type WP e-commerce, no quotes, and press enter. Do you see a search box on the top right? We'll type WP uh, space dash e-commerce, press enter. I got 769 results. All of these seem great. WP e-commerce shop to Facebook, smart variations, etc., etc. How do I know what the good one is, the best one? You look at the star rating. All of this data right here, metadata basically. Number of star ratings, or how high the star rating is, number of ratings, how many installations it has, when was it last updated, and is it compatible with your version? You might find a plugin that, based on the description, sounds amazing, but it has not been updated in a year. I think that's way too long. That's a whole year for the bad guys to figure out what's broken about the plugin to break into your site. If the theme author hasn't, the theme or plugin author hasn't updated their product in over a year, someone might have figured out how to break into it, leaving your site vulnerable. <clears throat> Four hours ago, the author updated it here. It's pretty recent. That's very good. Uh, seems to be on top of security issues. It's compatible with our version. That's good. I don't want to try to use an incompatible version that breaks my site and deletes my products and such. The latest version of it it already has over 60,000 installations. It's used with a lot, from a lot of, by a lot of sites. And it has four and a half stars out of five with 216 reviews. Some of these other ones, for example, this one here has a higher rating. Uh, oh, three and a half here. Four and a half here. This one's got a higher rating. But it's only six... Six reviews and only 600 or so installations. This one over here has a perfect five stars on one review. The author's mom. Updated 10 months ago. Hmm. So that's how you, you can tell how the good ones are. And then also, obviously, if it's got one star, probably stay away from it. 11, perfect 5, 11, 3. Uh, so this is how you tell what, um, what to download. So this is the one we're going to use, WP Commerce, 
and I'll show you examples of real clients that use it. It's a good plugin. It does what we need it to do. It might not have every feature that you need, um, but let me show you then the other big competitor in this space, in this uh, topic of e-commerce plugins. If you search at the top right corner for a plugin called WooCommerce, one word, WooCommerce. So again, over 2,000 results. You're going to read the, the you're going to look at the star ratings. <coughs> when was it updated? How many usage cases are there? And if you go further, if you click, for example, more details on any plugin, more details, you will see a screen where you can read reviews. So on any plugin, you can click more details, read reviews. Now comparing WooCommerce with WP eCommerce, many more installations, this was updated three weeks ago, many more installations, many more ratings, higher rating. This on paper seems a lot better. I've worked with both of those plugins for real paying clients. Both plugins work really well, but honestly for WooCommerce, it's often been more work, more effort to get this one to work how we want. Um, so as a beginner, I sort of feel you fight with this one a little bit more to get it to do what you want. And that may then turn you off from e-commerce, selling products online. So. I would say this one would be a bit more for the intermediate to advanced users and WP Commerce for beginning to intermediate users. So we're going to use WP Commerce, the other one, not the one with the porcupine, the one with the shopping cart. We're going to use this one because I feel as beginners it, it works out of the box a little better. And on your own, I would highly recommend that you do check that one out. Everything that we're about to learn will translate to, to WooCommerce really well. The, screen will, the screens will be a little different and the buttons a little different. But what you're going to see is oftentimes when you want to accomplish some things, they take more steps than WP Commerce because they could give you more options, more features, etc. Both are very good. Those are the two I recommend. WP Commerce and WooCommerce. And there's plenty of them, plenty other of them out there, but we're going to use WP Commerce. Question. Do you start with WP and then change it to Woo, or do you stop with what you start with? Unfortunately, not very easily because each of these plugins thinks that they can do this the best way. And therefore, uh, each of these plugins actually is going to have a mini database of your products. And so to transfer your products from one database to the other, is it can be done, but often it needs a little bit of extra setup. I've dealt with another commerce solution called uh, Business Catalyst. And on that one, I had a hard time, my company had a hard time taking their products out of some other, not even one of these, but some other shopping cart and putting it into Business Catalyst. So every shopping cart thinks they do it the best way. And so to transfer from one to the other, you can do it, but sometimes it takes a little effort. Now, again, you might say, well, really, we're going to go with three and a half stars compared to four and a half stars. Um, I do believe as a beginner, this is a very good way to start off. And I do believe also part of the reason that sometimes something gets lower stars is because it uh, it, it uh, and, I, and I read this recently, it was reinforced recently, people seem to remember negative experiences more than positive ones. We have a lot of great stuff happening in our lives, but we remember the negative stuff. So probably even yourself, I know it's happened to me, I go to a restaurant and I've had great experiences at a restaurant 
but I have one bad experience at a restaurant and I'm off to Yelp to complain. Why didn't I say something positive for all the great times that I had at that restaurant on Yelp? And I bring that up because perhaps out of these hundreds of thousands of installations, some amount of people felt this plugin doesn't do what I want. One star. And then they go off. And then many other people, it worked for them, and then they go on with their lives and they never remember to give a good review. So I'm not going to be worried that it doesn't have such great ratings as WooCommerce because, I, again, for beginners, I believe this works really well. And I just think people are more apt to be negative than positive. And people forget to give good reviews, but they don't forget to give bad reviews. It hurts that much. So on WP Commerce, click install. WP e-commerce. Install now. My instructions are saying, search WP Commerce. You should get the result of WP Commerce by the company WP e-commerce. Click install now. After installation, select activate plugin. With plugins, you can have as many as you want, and they don't need to be active. But again, like themes, these themes that are these plugins that are not active are going to be hanging around taking up resources, begging to be updated, and if you never use that slideshow plugin, you might as well delete it. You can have multiple plugins running at the same time, multiple plugins inactive, that's fine. Only themes one at a time. But even if you've got inactive plugins, they're still going to be using resources. They're going to be periodically checking the WordPress mothership. Is there an update? Is there an update? Is there an update? slowing down your site. So really only keep the plugins that you're going to use. On this screen here it says we've uh, installed it. Remember to activate. Click activate plugin. When you uh, have plugins, usually they are created by third parties. They're not from the official WordPress company. The parent company of WordPress is called Automatic. So most of the time, I'm going to say 99% of the time, you're using plugins from third parties. You're using plugins from other developers besides WordPress. That's normal. Uh, the issue with that is that there doesn't seem to be any consensus as to where do you put the the settings of your plugin in the dashboard because some plugins install themselves on one section or another and so I have a note here number six there are four new items added to our to our to our WordPress you also need to get this pop-up that might tell you what's new just go ahead and dismiss that But under the plugins screen, installed plugins, it tells us that WP Commerce is installed and active. It's blue. You can deactivate it. You can deactivate it. You can get support, documentation, etc. We've got version 3.11.1. So here under plugins, installed plugins is where you manage them all adding more, deleting them, deactivating, etc. This particular plugin then also did this. Click on the dashboard icon at the top. We have two items here. Store sales, WP e-commerce licensing. Also, when you're on the home view of the dashboard, you have all of this stuff here. Welcome to WordPress, and it says, if you scroll down on the bottom left, sales summary, sales by quarter, sales by month. Now you've got these new things to look at, how well your store is, is going. You also get a WP e-commerce news. So this screen's kind of getting a little crowded for me. What I'm going to do is, remember you can customize every screen. Let's customize the screen. It's getting too cluttered, I think. On the top right corner, 
click Screen Options. I don't need to see the WP Commerce News. I can read it later. I don't need to see the WordPress News. We'll move that. I don't need to see this Welcome. I'm a WordPress Pro. Turn that off. Um, sales Summary, sure. Sales by Quarter, sure. Sales by Month, at a Glance, Activity, Quick Draft. Um, uh, I don't want quick draft. I'm going to be focusing on at the moment. You can always turn these on and off. If you turn off quick draft, turn it back on. No big deal. But quick draft is a way for you to quickly create a blog post. That's not the focus of my class or my or my site. But it's just in my way. So I'm going to turn off quick draft just so that I can rearrange these boxes. I want to see the sales summary. It's one of the first things. I'm going to drag and drop sales summary box right at the top there. I'm going to drag the sales by month over here, maybe. Sales by quarter. I'm just rearranging my design. You don't have to do this, but I, I want to do this because I, I want to log into my WordPress and right away see these things here. Maybe I don't want to see 000 always. Turn it off. But I'm just customizing my screen a bit. And I can bring back, maybe I do want to see what's new in the world of WP e-commerce. Just click it and it comes back and it updates that changes in products and licensing. Let's take a let's take a quick look here under store sales. It's under dashboard. This is where it would show you in detail an order number, customer, how much they spent, the status of the order, etc. We've got this ability now. We've got this tracking system now because of this plugin. We have these features of a real store for free. And so here, this. As part of that database we created at the beginning of the day, we're saving this information, customer information, sales, amounts, and so forth. We're not storing credit card information, however. That's going to be dealt elsewhere. We'll talk about that later. But keep this in mind. Our website now is going to be saving customer data, names, addresses, phone numbers, if we choose to collect that information as part of our store. If I'm mailing people products, I need to know their home address. And maybe I ask for a phone number to call them in case there's a problem and such. If I'm selling virtual products, we'll see that we can set it up that we don't need to ask for a home address or a phone number and such. But I bring this up because you've probably heard about the, the things that happen a little too often of websites getting hacked, customer information getting stolen, credit card information getting stolen. In theory, th that could be you. You could be hacked. You could get credit card information stolen, bank information, uh, phone number information stolen of your customers. If you're going to be an online store now, you now will be collecting a database of information of customers. And then I always ask, when we get to this portion of the class, are you sure you want to become the next Amazon.com? That's what Amazon is up against. They're saving all of this customer information. Now you will be too. We're going to have a deeper discussion on cybersecurity and such a little later, but keep this in the back of your mind now. You're going to be collecting customer info, not credit card info at least, but home addresses and such. And you'll be able to access it here to send them their products, market to them, send them emails and so forth. And that's found under dashboard store sales. Let's look at dashboard WP Commerce licensing. If you buy the pro version of WP Commerce, you put in your license here and you get more features. So nothing really to do here, but this is where you activate the pro software. I need to update my handout here, actually. Uh, that's different. Okay, then we've got uh, B. 
a whole new products menu item shows up. We're not going to do much with it just yet, but if you hover your mouse over here, we've got a little shopping cart, products. This is where we're going to manage our inventory. The products screen will list all of our products. We can add new products. We'll do that soon. We'll talk about tags and categories for organization so that people can find your products. We'll talk about variations. I might sell t-shirts that are large, medium, and small. Those are variations. We'll talk about coupons. You can do coupons. And extensions are extra features that we pay for to add more capabilities to our shopping carts. Just taking a quick look here. Products, extensions, gold cart, membership subscriptions, Stripe payments, FedEx shipping, Amazon integration. So these are extra um, extra features of WP Commerce. The gold cart lets you do lets you customize your shopping cart more and such. Notice that's $99. This is a one-time fee. Um, when we get to it, we're going to talk about the way we are going to collect payments, money, is through PayPal. PayPal is free to set up. PayPal does take a commission, but they all take a commission. Whenever there's any money involved, there's always a middleman, unless you're selling that stuff directly from your porch during your garage sale. Whenever you're, trans whenever you're selling anything digitally, there's always going to be a middleman that takes the money from that person's account and puts it into your account. PayPal is what we're going to use, but there's other ways too. Stripe is an up-and-coming method, $79, to integrate Stripe with our shop. Um, Authorize.net is another big famous one, $79. USA ePay, Transfers, Payment Express. So there's different ways to collect money. The PayPal method is going to be a very straightforward way. Out of the box, we're going to be able to collect payments really well. If you've already got some sort of system, if you've already got uh, Braintree in your shop, you can add Braintree to your digital shop. $79. And WooCommerce is the same way. It's going to let you accept payments, usually through PayPal, for free. And then these other payment gateways, usually they cost money. That's how these plugins stay in business. Yes, someone is creating these plugins and such, but most likely not from the kindness of their heart. They probably want to profit a little bit. And these little bits at a time is how they profit. And there's, there's a whole cottage industry of people creating plugins and themes for WordPress and giving away a version that works really well and then charging some amount for the more advanced features. So we'll get back to the extensions later. Um, let's go look under pages. Click on pages, the icon pages. And under pages we have four new screens. Product page, checkout page, transaction results page, your account. So all of our products are going to be listed under products page. We can customize this of course, we'll get to that later. We will see a checkout screen when someone is ready to check out. They're going to get a transaction results after they finished paying. And if they choose to create an account, they can have a whole your account screen. So that's created for us. We can edit it to various degrees. That's one thing that also gets added via this plugin. We'll look at those screens in detail later. The one we're going to look in detail right now is one of the boring screens, but very important because this is going to be the settings of our store. And we just need to set them once and we're done, usually. So we're going to take some time to look under the settings screen. You go under settings and you have a brand new item, store. So whenever you install plugins, they may create a new item here, like products. They may attach themselves to the settings screen. They may attach themselves to the tools screen. They may go to the dashboard. There's no consensus, unfortunately to where does your plugin live. In this one, it's got a bunch of pieces on a bunch of different screens, and they're all listed on my handout. 
but under settings, let's go to store. That wasn't there before. Store then gives us several tabs at the top here, which we'll look at all of these. We'll start off with general. Base country or region. Where are you selling your products from? You cannot select more than one country, and so I'm going to select USA. You can either scroll down or click the drop down and then start typing USA, and it'll jump you down to USA. Select your origin country, select your origin state. Some of the things that I'm going to talk about when we talk about this e-commerce stuff, I can tell you as much as I can, and I can tell you first-hand experience, but oftentimes you will then need to figure out the details. You will then need to figure out eventually when we get to it, taxes and shipping, product inventory and so forth. And you're going to need to consult, perhaps, with FedEx or the post office. Um, you're going to need to consult, perhaps, with a CPA or your tax preparer and such because anyone can make a business, anyone can sell products, but the best businesses of course are, are the ones that are set up the most legitimately with a proper tax ID number and um, you know um, business license and all of that. Technically we don't need any of that. Technically we could be selling stuff and never tell Uncle Sam. You might want to tell Uncle Sam when you get income. So we'll talk about that later. But you're not going to need a business license, you're not going to need a merchant bank account and all of that, really. You're going to be able to get by without it, but from first-hand experience and such, I'll be pointing things out here and there. Base country. Target market. Are you selling your products all over the world? Are you shipping products to Andorra and Albania and Afghanistan, America, Samoa, etc., etc.? There's probably like 200 countries and territories listed there. Uh, you might not ship to some of these because it might be expensive. Or maybe you do sell to all of these countries because they're digital products. That's up to you to decide. Let's say Victor's Bakery, I'm selling cupcakes and cakes and such, but only in the US. I'm not going to ship something perishable over to Andorra. Does anyone know where in the world Andorra is? <laughs> Andorra is a tiny little country between France and Spain. If you look at a map, you think there's no space between Sp uh, France and Spain. There is. Andorra is in the middle of it. It's a tiny little country. But no, we're not shipping to Andorra or Algeria, etc., etc. So here's how, here's how I'll do it. You can do whatever you want here, but I'm suggesting click select none and then scroll down to activate USA we're shipping to throughout the US and you could activate more than one of course you can say well I am gonna ship to um, those are the islands in the Pacific possessions of the US out in the Pacific I'm not sure exactly sure which ones they are uh, but these are countries, uh, I mean, islands that the U.S. owns or protects or whatever, like out there by Hawaii and Tonga and all those Pacific islands. Hmm? No, I don't think. I don't think. Uh, I don't think that's one of them. Um, but maybe we ship to U.S. and Canada and Mexico, North America, let's say. So you can activate other countries. I'm just going to leave it on USA for the moment. Keep stock in cart for X days, hours, weeks. Have you ever visited a, a website, let's say Amazon, and you find some great products and you're about to buy it and you think maybe I should pay the mortgage first. <laughs> so then you go do that, then you get paid in a few weeks, a few days or whatever. You come back and it still shows on your shopping cart. It's waiting for you, tempting <laughs> you to buy it. That's what this is. If someone adds to their cart your product on your store at the moment, keep it in their cart for one day. This removes it from the inventory and someone else can't buy it. So if you've got one, if you've got one-offs, 
products that are unique and, and you chose here, yeah, let people keep that product in my cart for seven days. That's a whole week that it could have been sold, and then they ended up not buying it, and then you could have sold it within those seven days. So it's up to you to decide what you want, and you can do days, hours, and weeks, and apparently even fractions. So if you do 0 0.5 hours, half an hour, then you can have people only have their item in that cart for half an hour. It's that special. Do whatever you'd like here. I'm going to leave the default one day. Don't worry about hierarchical product category. Our permalinks are already properly set, so don't worry about that. Our currency is in USA dollars. Good. If we were selling, if we were in Canada, I could choose Canadian dollars. And this is kind of cool here because you can learn the currencies of the world. You can learn that uh, Turkmenistan has the manat. And uh, if you didn't know, Turkey has the lira. I believe also Italy has had the lira, didn't they? They've got the euro now. But anyway, here's how you can learn the. You can learn that Zambia has the kwacha, and Zimbabwe has also the U.S. dollar. So anyway, keep that as U.S. dollar. Probably, you can change the location of your currency sign. This is just cultural; it doesn't really matter. You can put it after the money. I mean, after the units or before. <laughs> You can put a space or not. It's just presentation. You can change how you show your, your thousands of decimals. Other countries flip these, which I always thought was so weird. But you can do commas as decimals and periods as thousands, like other countries. But you keep it as the usual US way, unless you want to change it. And then at the bottom, save changes. Any questions on this screen? general. Okay, let's jump over to admin, the admin tab. If you're selling virtual products, mp3 downloads, so music, or lectures, or ebooks, or PowerPoint presentations, digital files, people will need to download the file max downloads per file. This is saying if someone downloads my song and then they accidentally delete it or, or their computer crashes and they lose it, they have to buy it again. I've only let them download it once. You can let people download it three times in case they lose the first two. And then after that, buy it again because you, know, you already lost three copies of it. Well, how do you lose an mp3? So this doesn't matter unless you're selling digital products. So put whatever you'd like there. I think if you put it on zero, that means no limit. You can download it as many times as they want. The second one about lock download IP address. Again, only worry about it if you're selling digital products because what if I go to my friend's house and I buy that song if you had this turned on, I would only be able to download my song from their computer. The IP address is your unique internet address. Everyone has a unique internet address on their home, uh, you know, on their home computer. AT&T gives you your address or Cox or whoever you have, Time Warner. Everyone gets a unique internet address. If we tell it here, the person can only download it from the same original IP address they're going to need to go back to their friend's house to download it again. I still would not activate this, even if that's okay with you, because these companies like Cox and AT&T and such often change your IP address without you ever knowing for no reason, and it doesn't matter. So your IP address that Cox gave you a year ago maybe is still not the same one. And you never knew, and it doesn't matter, because you just use the internet. So this one is very dangerous, especially if you're selling digital products because they could lose access to their file. So I would leave that as no. If you're selling cupcakes through the mail, don't worry then. Um, we've got here check mime type. Don't worry about that one. That one is related to downloads and such. Don't worry. Store admin, you want to put in your email address because you're going to get an email address whenever someone buys a product, whenever there's a return product, 
whenever there's an inquiry and such. And usually this admin email is tied to the to the main general WordPress settings. You can switch them though. You can have general WordPress notifications sent to one email and store notifications set to a different email. You can make this up or put a real address. I'm just going to make it up, but that one's important there. This is where you're going to get notifications about your store activity. Terms and conditions. The TNCs, the terms and conditions. This is going to be totally up to you. It depends what you write here. Perhaps I'm selling one-of-a-kind products, and I'm going to write here. These are unique, one-of-a-kind products, no returns. So I'm adding that. And when someone goes to buy the product, there will be a check mark that says, I have read and agreed to the terms and conditions. It's not going to let the person buy the product until they've at least turned it on, at best read it, and adhered to it. So if you leave this empty, people will be able to buy the product with no terms and conditions, which you could be liable for a variety of things. I would put terms and conditions here, but this is going to depend on your product. You could put simply things here. Let's say here, Victor's Bakery. I'm going to say here's how to cover myself. Um, our baked goods are manufactured. Manufactured. How does that saying go? Manufactured in a facility that also processes nuts. nuts. Tree nuts. Our baked goods are manufactured in a facility that also processes tree nuts. Or just nuts. 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 So, here's a little bit of contractual safety net for you. You don't want to get sued when someone gets their banana bread and they have an allergic reaction because it had a peanut in it. Obviously, you're going to try as hard as you can for quality control. But here, you have at least some legal recourse. If you try to get sued, you're going to say, there were terms and conditions. The person could not buy that product unless they clicked, checked, I read and accepted the terms and conditions. Here you could put other things such as, no returns. I don't want half that banana bread back. It's kind of like paying like 25% off and putting all the currency factors in there too. And no, this is a bit more about legalese to cover yourself about liabilities of things. That 25% uh, off and such, we can do that on other screens. Coupons and other things. Oh, no, 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 not like, for instance, when people come in or make orders, like big orders, do we pay them back 25% of that? Oh, okay, sure, sure. That could be a way to do it also, that if you need to fulfill minimum, minimum requirements, that could be here as well. Um, I would make it, however, a bit more obvious because this is not going to show up unless the person clicks on, let me read the terms and conditions. There will be a check mark that says, do you accept the terms and conditions? But we, we know that when we read, when we make websites, they're not, they're not all listed there. We have to click. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is, you can always do a search, terms and conditions, template, or sample, or generator or boilerplate, maybe more specifically, restaurant terms and conditions generator. And you're going to find free versions, paid versions, etc., etc. This is going to really be on you how you set that. I do recommend to have a, the TNC, the terms and conditions. I do recommend it, but it's going to depend on you. So this is enough for this. I would recommend a more detailed one. You can write as much as you want there, and you will be covered a bit when someone buys your product, real or virtual. The next section, customer purchase receipt. You've obviously bought stuff online. You get a receipt confirmation. Here's how we can craft this. 
we have these various um, sort of uh, tags or, or shortcuts that we can add to the email, but first, from. Um, when someone buys something, they're going to get an email. Who did it come from? On the from address here, we could do, for example, sales at victorsbakery.com. You're going to get an email from sales. This is not saying that, that this is going to create an email account to make this work. You need to have an email account that already exists. So more professionally, you're going to see something like that. Sales at, at victorsbakery.com. You often also see no reply at victorsbakery.com. You need to have created these email addresses over at your provider, like Bluehost, GoDaddy, whatever. You could, of course, also do victorsbakery at gmail.com. Well, those are free. But that's not as professional looking, is it? Sales at victorsbakery.com, much more professional, I think, than victorsbakery at gmail. Anyone can make a gmail. But only you can make an email address with your domain because usually you pay for those. And oftentimes what you have here is no reply at whatever. Dot com. And this is coming from Victor's Bakery Fulfillment Team. For whatever you want. Sales department. Um, warehouse gnomes. Whatever. Where is it coming from? Email address. And this is the message that they get. Thank you for shopping. Thank you for purchasing with. And then it'll automatically put the shop name. So if you change the name of your shop later, it'll automatically update. That's what these tags are up here. These will get replaced with the appropriate information when the email gets sent out. You can have purchase ID, so their, you know, their shopping ID number, the shop name, a list of products they bought, total price, total shipping. A little question about where did you find us? How did you find our shop? Total tax. This boilerplate here, this uh, this general text here, it doesn't quite apply on my shop because it says any items to be shipped will be processed as soon as possible. Any items that can be downloaded can be downloaded using the links on this page. I'm not selling anything downloadable. I'm selling real things. So in my case, I'm just going to delete that so that it only says processed as soon as possible. All prices include tax and postage and packaging were applicable. You, order, you ordered these items. It will automatically show a product list, total shipping cost, total price. You can edit that how you want. There's a similar thing next over here. If, if stuff is going to be sent through the mail, you're going to have the ability to track that information. And so um, you can edit that. I'm going to leave it at it as is, but there's some customization there. Save changes. I'm going to skip taxes for the moment. This is a bit complicated. We'll come back to it. And I'm going to skip shipping also. We'll come back to that. Let's look at payments. Because we're making this store have these great products or goods or services. We want to get paid for it. Let's look at payments. These are the built-in payment gateways. Again, there's always a middleman when it comes to money, especially online. These companies here, either PayPal or Chronopay, is going to be in the middle. Someone visits my site, they want to buy this cake, they put in their credit card information, PayPal or Chronopay, whatever, checks that those funds are available, transfers those funds over to your bank account, and then tells your site the product was paid for, ready to ship the item. <coughs> that middleman. PayPal and all of these companies take some percentage, take some commission for that. There really isn't any payment processing company that doesn't take a commission some way or another. And so 
I don't know the commissions at the moment. I believe it's like 2.3 or 2.2 or something for PayPal. We can look it up. And ChronoPay might be more, might be less, but they all take a commission. Even that new fancy, that new fangled square that everyone loves, that takes a commission too. Like, I don't know, 1.5 or something. They all take a commission. And if they don't take a commission, maybe they, they charge you to rent the, the hardware, that swipe, that swiping thing. So there's always a middleman with money. For this class, and for even a real company, you're, you're fine using PayPal payments. Uh, PayPal payments. Hmm. Notice, however, Square is not an option here. Yeah. We would have to get the extra, extra plugin for that. Also with WooCommerce. WooCommerce, none of the companies really are integrating with Square yet. None of these shopping cart ones, Square is so new that you don't really see it integrated yet. But the great thing is that with uh, PayPal Payment Standard, all you need to do, and we'll go into more detail later, is if we create a free PayPal account, either personal or business, we can go to PayPal, create an account, and all we need to do then is put in our PayPal email address here, and it works. We can collect payments. So to test this out, don't write this, but if you want to send me money, sales at bmsync.net. Send me an email there, put up about a thousand dollars there, that'll work, and that'll be sending me money. So all you need to do is set up a PayPal account, the email address is plugged into here, and the front end, the user will never really, you know, see the nuts and bolts of it. They'll just say, oh, credit card, plug in my credit card, I'm done. A person doesn't need a PayPal account to use your site. They can use a plain old credit card like they're used to on every site. You have to set up a PayPal account. Once you've got it set up, you plug in your PayPal email address here, click Save, ready to collect payments. It's as easy as that. I do have a video that I can show you a little bit later that walks you through the steps of PayPal, but you can try it on your own and then we'll, we'll see how it goes. That's all you need. You don't need to change any other settings here. PayPal Pro has some other settings here for more advanced features, and PayPal Pro gives you more abilities to do extra things on your site. That one is the paid version on top of the commission, I believe. So then there's also PayPal Express. That's another way for this to get set up on your site. We're going to be going with the standard And this is what I was saying earlier about you're going to be collecting information from your customers, but not credit card information. PayPal or ChronoPay or Stripe or Authorize.net or whoever, they're the ones that are going to process credit cards and store them and keep them secure. So at the very least, you're not worried about that. You're going to have the, the full might of PayPal guarding that credit card information. They're going to process the money, keep it safe from hackers, um, your site will not store that credit card information. At the moment, the test gateway is the one that is set up. Notice we can activate more than one way for a person to pay. I'm going to leave it on test gateway, and if you click on settings, when someone tries to pay, it will say manual payment with some instructions. For the moment, and no one's going to see this because it's only on your computer, but we will just put here test gateway instructions, test, no products will be sold. So I'm sh showing you this because maybe you do have a real website online, victor.com, victorscupcakes.com, but I'm testing things out and I have the test gateway active. I'm not accepting payments. I'm not really selling anything. So I'm just making a note here for the people that are trying to buy something. That's what they'll see. No products will be sold. 
update and save changes. We have a few more screens I want to look at, but let's take a break. When we come back, we'll look at some of these other screens. Again, this is the boring thing, but it's important to set up because this is the core of your site. Once we set this up once, we won't have to deal with it again next time probably. It's 3 o'clock. Let's do 10 minutes. We're back at 3.10.